Professor Ryan, lovely to have you on the program. I want to go back to a period in 2015. It was kind of a dark time for FIFA, but from that emerged a whole lot of change. And one of the big changes was the fact that your position was created. You worked on the Reform Commission as well. Can you explain what sort of a position women's football holds now inside the halls of power of FIFA? A position that it once didn't. Yeah. Well, as many people know, and, and some may not, as you mentioned, there was a very dark moment for FIFA in 2015, uh, which led to the arrests of some of the top executives, basically for corruption. And although that was a difficult time for football, uh, it presented this incredible opportunity for women's football. And basically as part of this reform process that took place, it was recognised as the number one priority and the biggest growth opportunity to football and to our sport today. And that was a very, very clear message from the Reform Committee to the organisation that the position of woman in decision-making roles within football, from the top all the way down to the bottom, needed to be more. We also needed to have dedicated resourcing, ring fence specifically for the women's game, and all those 211 member countries around the world that belong to FIFA are constitutionally obliged to deliver women's football in their respective countries. And these are all things that we were able to put in as a result of the reforms. And it's been a little bit of a theme in my life. It's always moments of darkness that have led to amazing opportunities. And, uh, yeah, as a result, I'm sitting here talking to you today. There's a dedicated division for women's football. We have funding, investment. Uh, we have more teams and countries around the world participating than there ever have been before. Uh, the World Cup is the single biggest female sporting event in the world. I mean, I can go on and on and on. Um, and it's incredible. And to be part of that journey, um, it's such a privilege. Part of that journey also is um, things like commercialisation of the women's game and we know that, that can be a little tricky as well. Uh, broadcasters, uh, one particular group and a key stakeholder that yeah. have been a little slow to come to the party. Yeah. But what about all those other stakeholders? What about governments around the world mm. in, in non-traditional women football powerhouses, yeah. um, what about sponsors globally, yeah. like how is the rest of the sector fronting up? Listen, it's always a case of FIFA needing to lead from the front and also needing to put our money where our mouth is and that's something we've concretely done, it's something I'm pushing for every day and it takes a concerted effort. You know, we have some very lofty goals for women's football. We're trying to have 16 million women and girls playing our sport. Uh, from by, a base of what? From a base of 30. So we're trying to double it. Um, commercially, we want this sport to be self-sustaining. At the moment, it's no secret. We rely very heavily on revenues from the men's game in order to deliver our sport, to deliver our World Cups, to deliver the development programs all over the world. Um, and that's why we've now created a dedicated commercial strategy. We've unbundled the women's game from the men's game because we know there are organisations out there that want to invest specifically in women's football. And by driving that revenue through women's football, we can feed it directly back in. Legasso! So it's commercial partners, it's broadcasters, but it's also governments. And one of the incredible things about working in FIFA, which I never realised in all my life that football had this power until I arrived in FIFA, is that when you have a FIFA jacket on and you're sitting in a board position and you ask for an audience with the government or with these big organisations, the door opens and you can sit at the table and have conversations that any other traditional industry wouldn't allow you that um, and that's the incredible power of football and women's football is that growth trajectory and honestly if people don't get on board they're going to be absolutely left behind as it bounces off the surface Kerr nips in the mistake by Williamson and Sam Kerr 
I'll talk a moment about, you know, some of those that have been left behind in the past and are yeah. playing catch up now. <laughs> uh, but when you talk about power, I, I think it's a really interesting discussion in sport yeah. because it does carry um, a, an entree card, you know, that, yeah. that you might not have in, in other sectors. Yeah. But with that also comes great responsibility, doesn't there? Yeah. And sometimes those checks and balances mm. inside organisations mm. um, are lacking. Yes. in sport. Yeah. I know that FIFA is held to account constantly. <laughs> Big time. <laughs> but, but what has that learning experience been like as well? Listen, I think what happened in 2015 was the greatest thing that could have happened to this organisation. You know, as a result of that, the reforms, everything that changed within the organisation was all for the better and the checks and balances that are in place now are more stringent and tighter than any other sporting organisation in the world. We're very transparent about every dollar that we spend where it goes and it's hard sometimes because there is this misconception and I get it because of what's happened in the past. You know FIFA is always associated with greed and you know money and the truth is, every dollar that comes into FIFA goes directly back out into football. And it's something that I wish more people understood, rather than thinking that we're always trying to take, you know. Um, and maybe that was the case in the past. In fact, it was. <laughs> but it's totally not the case now. And I, I think the biggest indicator is the US government. I mean, the US government was very much a driver of the entire scandal that happened. And through this process and the years following the reform, FIFA was actually recognised as a victim. We had 300 million, I believe it was, in funding that came back to us. 300 million US. US. So about 440 million plus Aussie exactly. dollars. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Um, because throughout that, as an organisation, FIFA was actually a victim of those corrupt individuals that used their positions of power you know, to misuse mon money and take back hands or whatever they were doing. Um, and yeah, there are people like that in the world, but as an organisation, it's clear what we're trying to do. It's to grow football and to give opportunities to boys and girls all over the world, in every country, and we have 211, <laughs> to play football. How much of that 300 million US that has been returned to um, FIFA has gone into the women's game because I, I know you've got like this eight point strategy I think it yeah. is you know and, and you were quite involved in, in writing that yeah. um, and programs all around the world mm -hmm. from grassroots through to the elite, yeah. mentorships mm -hmm. not just for players but looking at coaches, mm -hmm. looking at administrators, has yeah. is, is some of that money gone into that? So that particular pot of money has gone to uh, the FIFA Foundation the FIFA Foundation is a, is a kind of a, a separate organisation that is set up and funded through this and other funding from FIFA. And a big, big portion of their activities is focused on girls specifically uh, and women's football. So yes, huge. And uh, what you've listed there is also very much the bread and butter uh, of what me and my team are doing on a day-to-day -day basis. People associate FIFA with the World Cups, which is fantastic. Those are mega, mega sporting events, I get that. But what they often don't know is actually away from the World Cup and the shiny stadiums and those massive mega events, in those four years in between, we're working every day in countries all over the world, supporting them, funding them, resourcing them, capacity building, all these programs that you mentioned. Um, and for me personally, that's what drives me. It's when you get to go somewhere like South Sudan, I've just launched a women's league for the first time, and you get to physically see and meet the young women and girls who are playing and feel their excitement and the impact. It's so rewarding. And there are very few organisations in the world you can work for that gives you that level of satisfaction in what you're doing. I know that you were a player for some oil. You went on yeah. to be CEO of the football organisation there. We've just seen the appointment in South Africa yeah. of a new yes. CEO of South African football. Uh, she was also a former player. Yeah. Um, how much do those sorts of changes impact FIFA as a whole? As we start to see, yeah. you know, the, the shades of, of gender and people yeah.
getting to the top yeah. in what was pretty much a, a Eurocentric organisation. <laughs> yeah. A male Eurocentric. Yeah, yeah, yeah. An ageing the, male yeah, Eurocentric. Yeah. Um, the pale, stale yeah. male. <laughs> That's what they called it. Um, you know what? It's amazing. Lydia, uh, who's just been appointed the CEO in South Africa, incredible woman, amazing. Obviously a former athlete, so she lives and breathes the sport. She knows what it's like, but her business acumen is also massively on point. So big, big appointment, and I'm so proud of her. Like She really deserves it. And her appointment has created a buzz. I mean, the fact that you asked me the question, you've heard about it, for me is amazing. Um, what I'd like to get to the point though in our sport is actually when women are appointed to these roles it's not a big deal, it's not celebrated, it's like the norm that a woman has taken up a role like CEO. But you know what, it's making a big impact, the ripples are everywhere. The number of females who are in that position CEO uh, in the 211 countries I think is more than quadrupled. Uh, since we've gone through this reform process. There are more female presidents now. We're still a long way from where we need to be. There are 211 countries and there are still very, very few that have female presidents, but we need to continue pushing. Um, we now have seven female members in our council. Six of those positions are, uh, I would say, quotas. They have to be females. But for the first time now through Europe, we had a woman run against men and she is now voted into a position that's not a quoted woman's position. So these trends, we're starting to see them happen at the highest level, but also even at club level. You know, since I've been here in Australia these two and a half weeks, we've had a chance to visit a lot of grassroots clubs. I've been really pleasantly surprised by the number of women who are leading these grassroots clubs, you know, and actually, it is women who are really driving things at the community level. So it's good to see that filter all the way through. Mm. One of the um, great lessons from Qatar, mm. I think, was that we saw the World Cup opened up yeah. to a whole new region. Both in the sorts of people that attended mm. and even the teams that succeeded. Mm. You know, the, the story oh. of Morocco yeah. was sensational. Yeah. But Morocco is also going to be competing in the Women's World yes. Cup here for the very first time. Yeah. And you've got a bit of a backstory, haven't you? About yeah. That? You know what? Um, the Women's World Cup effect, that's what I call it, it can never be underestimated. And what I mean by that is. It is the biggest moment of women's sports. And in that moment, it's not just about what happens on the field and who eventually lifts the trophy. There's so much going on around it. And Morocco is a perfect case. In France, in 2019, four years ago, the president of the Moroccan Federation, he was at the final. He was in that stadium in Lyon. He saw the full stadium, the, the crowd going absolutely nuts. He witnessed the amazing spectacle that was happening on the pitch, the sport itself. He saw the commercial activation, the interest from all the advertisers, everything. And it impacted him in a massive way. And so much so that he went home and he invested massively into women's football. He bought one of the best coaches in the world, the former Olympic Lyonnais, the best club in the world in the women's game. He bought the coach, put him in place leading the national team. He created a program from U15 all the way to seniors. I went there. The facilities for under 15 girls, because of this investment, are better than some of the professional facilities I've seen for men in Europe. Like this is how much it impacted him. And as a result of that, I've now qualified for the first time ever and will be playing here in Australia and New Zealand later this year. It's been interesting watching, I guess it started in the US, that, that was yeah. where the domestic league kind of really took off mm. and, and set the benchmark. Now we've seen the European clubs and leagues taking over, mm. but how far away is uh, an equivalence, if you like, of, mm. of quality domestic leagues yeah. in areas that currently don't have them? Yeah. You know what, this is a really good question and it's something that occupies a lot of my time. Um, it's very clear in the men's game that there are certain regions that really dominate. Um, and it's no secret, Europe, South America. 
In the women's game, we're starting to see a trend towards that same way. And what's really important for us at FIFA, particularly through events like the World Cup, that we try to rise all tides together. And there are big challenges around this. You know, some regions in the world, women are not even allowed to play or enter onto a field. Then you've got countries like current world champions, the United States, where they're fully paid professionals playing on a regular basis. It's some of the best known athletes in our sport. And we do a lot of work on professionalization. One of the biggest, biggest things we can do is invest into the clubs, the leagues, and the grassroots. Um, and for me, competitions is important. We always talk about participation. We want 60 million women and girls, but honestly, if you don't have good competitions being played on a regular basis at every level, where are those girls going to go? Where are they going to go? So we put a huge amount of investment. We have a, a specific program which focuses on building and strengthening leagues around the world. And predominantly, we focus in regions where we know there is a huge gap between some of the bigger leagues like the likes of Europe United States of America that you mentioned. And the idea really behind that is to see how we can close that gap. Um, but one of the things I quite love about women's football is at U17 and U20 level, it's anyone's game. You'll see it. You, in one year you'll have a team from Asia win, you can have a team from Comnibol win the next year, Europe. So actually in women's football at the youth level up to U20, it's very even and anyone can win and be world champions at that level. So what we have to focus on is between that U20 and the Senior World Cup, how do we keep that balance and close that performance gap? And it's got to be a concerted effort from many, many people, not just FIFA. Just to say though, it's glorious, absolutely glorious. It's intrigued me to um, just take a look at some of the other stories that are developing around the world in mm. football. And, uh, you know, I, I didn't know that Saudi Arabia mm. had a women's league. Yeah. Uh, and it's been running, you know, for a while. Yeah. It's, uh, they're looking at expansion mm -hmm. and all sorts of things. We know that they're bidding for uh, the Asian Cup yeah. for women against an Australian bid. <laughs> um, how much of uh, a, a barrier do you think there is mm. to change or a resistance to change? Yeah. And I wonder what the media's role is in trying to break down some of those barriers yeah. or in fact just reinforcing those barriers yeah. because we tend to hear the same stories over and yeah. over and all of a sudden you turn around and take a look and oh wow, there's a whole lot of stuff that's changed. <laughs> yeah that we haven't actually yeah. been paying attention to? Well, Saudi Arabia is actually a perfect example um, where there are a lot of negative perceptions around that country and in particular the position of woman in that country. And admittedly there are some very tough laws in that country that for those of us that were raised in the Western world and are used to what we're used to, we find them very difficult to accept. But I always like to say that actually that country and many other countries from that region and other regions are on their own journey. They are set on a very different foundation to us, a very different religious background, a very different cultural background. And they develop and they move forward and progress in their own timeline. And it's difficult to see people imposing their beliefs and their values on those countries without understanding that history and really knowing what's going on. And football is something that can progress that growth and accelerate it. And that is something that's beautiful about our sport. They've launched a league for the first time. Women are playing. There are women who are now leading the Football Federation. In fact, the Vice President of the Saudi Arabia Football Federation is a woman. She just got elected and she's also the woman leading the charge in developing and growing the women's game in that country. That's an incredible achievement. I know her personally, Namia, she's an incredible woman. And because of the negative perceptions around the country, 
Nobody actually wants to look at that and understand how much progress has been made there. And that's where I think football can cut through that. And you talk about media, media have such a big role to play in that. And it's something that often I get really frustrated with because it's very easy to pick up on that rhetoric that everyone has. Oh, okay, it's negative, it's bad for women. But actually, when you dig a bit deeper, you get the stories of Lamia the start of this league, the women that have progressed through that football federation, the young girls who are now playing who never dreamed they would be able to play because of the progress that's been made. Um, and it, it's important that those stories are told. How responsible does FIFA feel for driving those sorts of changes? Mm. Or is it enough for FIFA to provide the platform where change can be brought about because of things like what we're seeing in Saudi Arabia mm. with regard to women mm. or the changes that we saw happen in Qatar with regard to workers' rights. Yeah. Because a lot of people said FIFA should have done more. Yeah. How much can you do? Yeah. How big is your remit? <laughs> How well, many it's, days it's are there in a, your yeah, week? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> How many hours are there in a day? You know what? It's a combination of both. We have the platform. We have the most popular sport in the world. Literally millions and millions of women, girls, men and boys are playing our sport. So we have an obligation to use that platform as a way to better society. So there's that. But we also should be driving change. And Iran is a perfect example where we were able to use that platform to actually drive change and have women attending for the first time ever football matches in stadiums. I got a WhatsApp actually two days ago showing me a photo of the most recent local match where women in Iran were in the stadium celebrating. That's an example of how football can open doors and, and drive change. So it's a combination of both. I often think people believe our remit is much more <laughs> than what we can do. After all, we are only a sport, but we do not underestimate the power we have being the most popular sport in the world. And like I said, it can open doors that other traditional avenues cannot. When you're coming, representing FIFA, the biggest sport, representing football, there are conversations you can have that you otherwise would never be able to. And that's something that's really powerful and unique and we don't take that lightly. When uh, the 2023 FIFA Women's World Cup is all done, mm. what do you hope will be the legacy, both here in Australia and in New Zealand? Well, first of all, there should be, I, I want to see it be the number one participation sport in this country. And what struck me about Australia, which I didn't realise, until they were awarded the hosting of this event, is how competitive the sporting environment here is. It's absolutely crazy. I think the only other place I think with that level of competitiveness is America, where the different sporting codes, are, they compete so massively. And I'd love to see it be the number one participation sport for females here uh, in this country. And not only in terms of participation on the field, but participation in decision making, in the administration, in technical roles in and around the pitches, in the boardrooms, um, and fans, fans as well. You know, um, we were fortunate enough to be here when the A-League, the women's uh, A-League uh, final, you know, it was incredible to see a record crowd there, amazing, but I'd love to see that stadium full. And I think that will happen after this Women's World Cup. And the same in New Zealand, you know, we're always competing with rugby there. There's a much bigger lift to do in New Zealand um, in terms of growing the popularity of the sport. Um, here in Australia, the Matildas are massive. Everyone wants to be Sam Kerr. Um, the team is everywhere. In New Zealand, we don't quite have that with the football firms. There's some incredible athletes playing for some of the best teams in the world, but they're just not as known. So there I would love to see those women being recognised for the amazing work that they do and the incredible athletes they are. Um, but beyond New Zealand and Australia, the Pacific region for me is obviously very dear, uh, having spent so many years in Samoa. 
um, and the wider Asia region as well. Um, we've just got to break down those barriers and make sure that every opportunity that a young boy has through football is also there for every young girl. And just in closing, what role does Australia have in that, in the broader Oceania region? Yeah. Because after the World Cup, many of these nations will be back for the Olympic Games in yes. Brisbane 2032, which Brisbane promised would be a Games for the region. Yeah. What can Australia do to, to help facilitate that growth and that yeah. change in Oceania? A lot, a lot, yeah. Uh, through funding, through resource, and I know there's already a lot of that that goes on. Um, through the foreign affairs here, uh, but also expertise and capacity building. You know, people in the islands are so passionate about sport and the raw talent that exists in the athletes there, honestly, the potential is limitless. But often what is missing is the, the business acumen and just the, the capacity building around the administrative side, the governance side. And that's something that I think Australia is particularly strong in. And I think it's about getting in to the environment of the country because you can't come in with an Australian lens into a Pacific island. You need to know and understand the culture in that country and then tailor make the support to the needs of that country. But I think Australia has a huge role to play in seeing sports grow and develop in the Pacific region. Sarai Barryman, thank you so much. Thank you.